Hi, this is Eric Boyce, CEO and Chief Investment Officer for BKA Wealth Consulting, and these are Charts of the Week uh, for July 6th of 2020. Please see our disclaimer for important information. So as we start our chart pack this week, I want to point you to a couple of things that have been talked about, but uh, at least you can see it here. Uh, first is the hotel occupancy rate, and we know that uh, obviously business travel came to a complete halt, uh, leisure travel, uh, really the same thing. We know leisure is coming back a little bit. We know that uh, that business travel is going to take a while, but you, as you can see here, you know, just the, the, the virtual uh, shutdown in hotel occupancy, even in our own neighborhood, we've seen several hotels that were that basically said, listen, we can't even keep minimum staff. We're just going to shut down. And so you see that number, you know, compared to prior uh, seasonality, uh, looking back over the last three years. But at the same time, you could see that trough in late April is, is you know, May was kind of an opening point uh, for some economies. Uh, Texas uh, allowed some of its restrictions to expire on April 30th. And you could see, you know, that gradual uptick in activity uh, in hotels. And, uh, you know, while I wouldn't say that this is kind of the most bellwether indicator of economic health, uh, it at least does give you some perspective uh, on, uh, you know, how a very important part of our uh, economy, that being travel, leisure, mobility, uh, is picking up in, in a somewhat li linear fashion, as you can see through uh, June this far. Uh, housing affordability, uh, obviously with interest rates moving down, uh, the 10-year treasuries hovering in kind of a rough band between you know, I'll call it, you know, six tenths of 1% to seven tenths of 1%, uh, more or less, has really improved housing affordability. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, increased uh, uh, refinancings and, 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 and mortgages. And, and frankly, you know, in the, in the national real estate data, uh, we did see a, a rather uh, pronounced, as would be expected, uh, drop in activity uh, related to COVID, but we also saw a corresponding increase in the uh, uh, average uh, sales price. But uh, affordability is increasing. Uh, that's a good thing for consumers at a time where we know that their back wallets are being challenged with COVID and, you know, just the enormity of the response to, you know, people seeking aid and using stimulus money and things like that, uh, that, uh, that this is a good sign uh, as we look forward, not into the next month or two, but into 2021, because we feel pretty strongly that those interest rates are going to remain low. And so we should expect to see housing affordability uh, continue uh, to improve, especially if we get a, a bit of a moderation in uh, price growth, which we, we expect. Uh, bankruptcies. Now, we talked about this in our market minutes, and, um, and it was just kind of a side note, but this really is important when you look at uh, the health of the corporate sector. And so, you know, this is for public and private companies and, you know, with, with liabilities of greater than 50 million. And, and, you know, this is at its highest point since uh, uh, 2009. And so it's, it's, um, it's important to note, you know, we saw a fairly, you know, modest amount of annual uh, turnover uh, if you will, you know, for those uh, intervening years uh, between the last recession uh, and what transpired, you know, last year. And, and ironically, you could see 2019 kind of perked up a little bit, uh, but, you know, as companies were taking on more leverage, uh, and then we saw a lot of speculative activity, especially in the energy sector, as we hit the beginning of this year uh, and oil uh, prices uh, cratered, that that just uh, kind of put a lot of companies over the edge. So this is something that we want to watch, uh, basically the health of the uh, indicator of the health of the corporate sector. So this is a, an indication as we transition from the corporate sector to the household sector. And, you know, we were, you know, we've been priding ourselves on the health uh, of the household sector. And I think to a large extent, that's true, uh, especially if you look at the delinquency rate, which is in red, and you can see in prior cycles that delinquency rate has been, frankly, a lot higher than it is now. And, you know, we've seen that eke up over the last several years. I mean, we've seen consumer loans, uh, 
you know, increased. People have taken on more leverage. And of course, you know, incomes were supporting it. The economic backdrop was supporting it until COVID. And when you see that unemployment rate, you know, trending uh, up, spiking up like, like it is, now you can only help but to see that there's a lag uh, effect uh, to, to some degree on, uh, you know, on some of this. So, you know, I wouldn't even say that there's a loose relationship uh, well, I'd say that there's a, 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 a loose, I will say that there is a loose relationship uh, here between the delinquency rate and unemployment. Uh, but uh, I think what this highlights is that we were seeing some trends kind of play themselves out over the last several years. Like, for instance, student loan debt, we know has just gone through the roof. And as if we see the delinquency rate begin to approach some of those prior uh, peak levels, uh, and that's that's on the right hand side. You know, if it goes from 2.1 to say 2.8 or 3 3 percent, uh, you're going to see a, a bit more stress on the financial sector. So this is an interesting chart that I thought was worth sharing. It's personal income uh, and personal income excluding government transfers. And so you know, this is just kind of strips out the benefit of what's been put in people's uh, pockets as a result of government transfers here in the wake of COVID. And it's just a, a huge, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a huge delta uh, and uh, just really almost unprecedented. And you can see the drop on ex external transfer receipts, but the number that gets reported, uh, and the reason why we have uh, so much uh, money uh, sitting in the banking system right now is because of that uh, kind of that uh, gray, grayish blue line up above. Uh, and this chart uh, represents real uh, gross domestic product and inflation. Uh, and this is a year over year change. Now, I will say that there is a strong relationship here uh, to uh, inflation. And, you know, the data uh, for core CPI, and this is built on a six quarter lag. So think of it almost like a year and a half lag to GDP. And that relationship is, is stronger when you look at it on a trend line basis. Uh, and uh, so, you know, you look at CPI and you look at what happened in GDP and we know that we have the big dip. We don't quite know what it is. We won't know until the end of this year, but uh, you know, what that portends is a a meaningful drop in inflation. And what you don't want to see, and this is, I think, the biggest risk, is not uh, necessarily uh, inflation uh, right now. I think inflation manifests itself next year, but at least, you know, for the next six months is a deflationary uh, environment uh, uh, that uh, is, is dovetails uh, with this chart. So I think we want to bear, bear watch. Uh, we're in an unusual spot because I think we do need to be worried about kind of secular inflation uh, as we get down the road because there's too much money sloshing around. And when it leaves the, you know, the, the, the banking sector and enters the economy, when people can get back to work and interact, uh, that could be highly inflationary. But uh, in the short term, uh, you know, th there, are other, uh, there are other influences uh, afoot. And this is a chart of GDP again. Uh, now, again, just showing you the magnitude of the dislocation uh, in April uh, and how far we drop. Uh, but on the right-hand side is the GDP response during prior recessions. And again, this is this, if nothing else, just for shock value. We get this information from Guggenheim Investments, which does a, uh, Scott Minerd does a really good job of uh, kind of putting this all into perspective. And you know this chart on the right just shows you uh, relative to 2007 and 2000, and uh, uh, excuse me, the average is the gray line of post-war recessions. And 2007, which we all consider to be a fairly stout uh, economic dislocation, uh, you can see that it pales in comparison with what we saw in basically one month uh, this year. So uh, again, just for perspective, found it very interesting. And you know, if, uh, you know, if people will be talking about this and scholars will be studying this uh, 10, 20, 30 years from now. 
And finally, I guess we'll end on a, a COVID uh, note. Uh, we have uh, daily new cases um, of, uh, of uh, you know, different areas. And, and this is the big bugaboo right now, right? Because we've got the northeastern states, which are really the hot zone previously. Then we've got the southern states and, and other states along, along the Sun Belt uh, out west that, that are participating in this upswing. Uh, but as I mentioned on uh, my uh, market minutes uh, conversation, look at that chart on the right. These are the seven day moving averages of new deaths. So while we have had a spike in cases and we know that 80 percent of the deaths that have been recorded, almost 81 percent have been in that, in, in that older, much older cohort, uh, that the overall death rate continues to slide despite this rise in cases. So. Again, not to belittle the fact that we're seeing uh, more cases along the Sun Belt, but just to note that there that this disease, as this is playing itself out, is not proving to be perhaps as deadly uh, as we thought. And again, that is going to play. You know, I don't mention that to make a statement other than to say it's going to play a factor in politicians' minds as they ponder the pros and cons of opening the economy or loosening restrictions. So we want to uh, just monitor that. Uh, and I lied, I had one more chart and this is coming to us from First Trust. Uh, and all this does is it shows the entry uh, year declines versus the calendar year returns and that's in blue. And we know that the average annual market return is 10% if you reinvest dividends, but what is lies underneath that is the volatility in the markets within that year. So if you look at the, you know, uh, go back and, and look at 2019, we had a phenomenal year. The market was up 29%, uh, but we had an entry year decline of 7%. So the net of that, so basically we had a, what, a 38% a uh, market swing, but uh, we ended up 29%. And so uh, just suffice it to say that, you know, this is more kind of, you know, food for the soul, if you will, for people that have been uh, really disaffected by the volatility this year to, to say, if you look all the way going back to 1980, uh, that you have had a, a lot of volatility uh, that you just haven't really paid attention to. Because you look at those annual returns and say, well, they're, they're blue, they look good. Uh, but within each of those years, uh, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, of uh, downside uh, capture uh, that, has, uh, that has played itself out and then kind of recovered. So again, we're fighting a deficit of 34%. Uh, we're still fighting out of it, even though the market has had a, a thunderous comeback. We're still down about really 3% now uh, through the end of the uh, calendar quarter. But, you know, just this is really more for long-term perspective that uh, if you have a long-term investment horizon, you know, these types of volatility events will play themselves out and they'll be muted over time. You'll have a, a time um, diversification element that is going to uh, benefit you. And this chart is very emblematic of that. So uh, with that, we will conclude our comments on our charts of the week for today. Uh, we enjoyed having you with us, and I hope that if you have any comments uh, or concerns, you uh, reach us at the information provided on your screen, and hope you have a wonderful week, and stay safe.